The fifth chapter discusses the theory and application of economic valuation of natural resources and environmental impacts. The key questions that will be addressed over the next few days are what is economic value? Why is it important to know the value of environmental resources and impacts? Types of economic values? Valuation techniques? And applications of valuation techniques? The key concepts discussed are total economic value, welfare, willingness to pay, willingness to accept, economic surplus, and economic valuation. Remember to add this to your glossary. Economic value is determined on the basis of individual preferences and the use of economic activity to increase human welfare. Welfare is derived from the consumption of a combination of goods and services. These may be of private or public origin and or non-marketed goods such as scenic view and service flows such as carbon sequestration and the natural water filtration functions. In addition, Individuals may derive welfare from the knowledge of the existence of certain ec ecosystems or species due to an altruistic or ethical concern for the environment. It is, however, important to note that economic value does not consider the survival or welfare of a species apart from the preferences society places on these. The basis of standard welfare theory rests on the ability to substitute between various goods and services. The figure shows an indifference curve where environmental and private goods are traded to maintain the same level of utility. This curve shows a range of traded ratios and thus individual preferences between these two types of goods. For instance, an individual initially had P1 private goods and E1 environmental goods. In order for him or her to accept the decline of private goods up, of up to P2 and have the same utility who or she, will increase his or her environmental goods to E2. The value measures placed on these traders are known as the willingness to pay and willingness to accept compensation. Thus, to gain an improvement in environmental goods, this individual is willing to pay P1, P2 private goods. The same individual is willing to accept compensation of P1, P2 private goods to accept the decline in the environmental goods from E2 to E1. However, these concepts can also be expressed in monetary terms. Willingness to pay is the maximum amount that an individual would be willing to pay for an increase in the quantity or quality of some good or service or to avoid a decrease in the quantity or quality of the good or service. At this price, the individual is indifferent between paying the money and improving or maintaining the environmental quality or quantity or spending the money on other goods. Willingness to accept, on the other hand, is the minimum amount that an individual would be willing to receive in order to accept a decrease in the quantity or quality of the good or service. Economic valuation is important due to the fact that not all impacts of an economic activity are calculated and thus taken into account. As a result, valuation strives to assign economic values where there are no markets so that all costs and benefits can be incorporated. Once these values are available, economic bads such as pollution can be minimized as economic incentives can now be presented to firms and the polluter pays principle can be implemented. Furthermore, an incentive is also created to provide and or maintain environmental goods such as conservation as the economic benefits can be more clearly presented. As a result, these values can be fed into, into decision-making process Thus, proposed policies, projects and actions and the alternatives can be weighed given a common monetary unit. Valuation attempts to measure changes in welfare or utility, typically using a utility function. This function is explained with variables such as market goods and services, income and price levels, as well as the quality or quantity of environmental goods and services. However, utility cannot be valued empirically, so the concept of economic surplus is used instead. This, this is a combination of consumer and producer surpluses. The consumer surplus exists on the benefit or consumer side and is measured using utility on difference curves. Willingness to accept or willingness to pay is thus determined by changes in utility. Since indifference curves are not directly observable, the market demand curve is used. 
The market demand curve consists of various quantities of a good demanded, given varying prices. Thus, it provides an indication of preferences. The consumer surplus is then the area below the demand curve and above the price line, that is, PAB. Changes in environmental quality or quantity will thus either increase or decrease consumer surplus. The producer surplus occurs on the production side or the supply curve. Your environmental quality affects the productivity of the firm and thus affects economic rents or profits. Since firms are owned by households and thus individuals, changes in productivity affects the utility. Thus, willingness to pay or willing to accept is given by changes in production. The producer's surplus is equal to the area under the price line and above the supply curve, that is, the area PAB, and changes in environmental quality or quantity will thus either increase or decrease producer surplus. Economic surplus is then the net change in producer and consumer surpluses and thus the net social gain or loss. There are several problems associated with the economic valuation of the environment. The first set relates to the morality of valuing the environment and its impact such as life, health, biodiversity, etc. This is largely due to the embedded religious and philosophical values of society. Most people are subject to placing monetary values on these things. Secondly, there is some difficulty in valuing extinct species as there is no way of determining individual preferences for these. The other problems relate to the technical aspects. An overarching issue is the availability of data which is often sparse due to the lack of markets. Furthermore, valuation techniques tend to be subjective. The value is in the eye of the beholder. Thus, depending on the choice of technique and how this is applied, values may differ substantially. Other specific issues will be discussed in relation to the rele relevant techniques further on. Total economic value of a good or service shows the extent to which individuals would sacrifice other goods or services to acquire a quantity of this good or service and is compromised of use and non-use values. Use values consist of direct use, indirect use, and option use. However, option use is not considered a true use value and thus the connecting line is not solid. Direct use values are those values that derive from the actual use of an environmental good or service. They can be consumptive, in other words, they can be consumed and will not be available for use by anyone else. Examples of this are timber and coal. Direct use values can also be non-consumptive, thus they can be enjoyed without there being less for anyone else. Examples of these are picnic spots, hiking trails, and, and a view of a mountain. Indirect use values are values associated with the ecosystem functioning of the environment. Examples are carbon sequestration, the nutrient cycle, and water purification. Option use value is related to the future use of the environment. Although individuals are not actively using the resource, they may be willing to pay a certain amount to ensure that certain environmental goods are available for their own possible use in the future. Non-use values can be divided into bequest and existence values. Bequest values relate to the, to the desire to protect the environment for future generations, while existence value relates to the value that an individual places on it by virtue of the mere fact that it exists and not actual or potential future use of it. Several valuation techniques is, exist. However, the application of these is dependent on whether there is a market available or not. If a market exists, then the prices should be used as a basis of valuation. Examples would be the value of minerals. If the price is efficient, then it can be directly applied. However, Inefficient or distorted prices must be adjusted before they can be applied. Distortions can occur due to government interventions such as subsidies and taxes, imperfect competition and information asymmetry, etc. The adjusted market price is known as the shadow price. If no market exists, then three different approaches can be adopted. The first is a direct proxy approach. Here one uses a proxy market, for instance, 
A wetland has certain water purification functions, therefore one can consider the cost of other water purification systems as a proxy for the water purification of a wetland. The cost of price information of the related good or service is used to determine the willingness to pay. However, this amount represents the minimum willingness to pay for the environmental good or service. Examples of direct proxy methods are the preventative or mitigative expenditure and replacement cost methods. Secondly, the indirect proxy method can be used when no directly related market is available. Here, the behavior of individual consumers observed to determine their willingness to pay for related services. For instance, one can estimate the value of a beach by observing what individuals are willing to pay to go there. Examples of indirect proxy methods are the travel cost and hedonic pricing methods. The last step of approach is the no proxy method. The no proxy methods are based on the creation of a hypothetical market where individuals are asked to state their preferences and a willingness to pay or accept compensation for changes in environmental quality or quantity. Examples of these stated preference techniques are contingent valuation and conjoint analysis. Within Chapter 5's notes, there is a taxonomy of various environmental valuation techniques available. Have a look at these. The the taxonomy provides a guideline in terms of the most appropriate valuation techniques that can be used for specific environmental goods or problems. Some of these techniques provide a more comprehensive total economic value as they include a greater variety of the use and or non-use values. It is therefore important to note what the specific technique includes and excludes to avoid double counting when using a combination of techniques. A selection of the specific techniques are discussed in more detail within this chapter and are subdivided based on the approach within which they fall, namely direct or indirect proxy and no proxy methods. As mentioned before, the direct proxy methods use the cost information of proxy markets to provide an approximation of the willingness to pay of an environmental goods, service or impact. A few of these methods will be discussed, namely replacement cost, preventative or mitigation expenditure, productivity loss, opportunity cost, cost of illness, human capital costs, and benefit transfer. The replacement cost method is related to the replacement of environmental goods or services. For example, if a forest was removed for development, it could be replaced by planting more trees elsewhere. It first assumes that the nature and extent of the physical damage is predictable or has a damage function. This expresses a clear cause and effect relationship of environmental changes. The second assumption is that the cost of replacement or restoration can be reasonably accurately estimated. Thirdly, the replacement costs are considered to be a lower bound of the actual willingness to pay and are now thus less than or equal to the true economic value. Two variants exist. The first variant considers the relocation of victims of environmental damage, here the original environment is replaced by another. The second variant is the shadow compensating projects. This variant offsets environmental damage by implementing a project that would replace the lost environmental services. The technique generally used relies on the collection of, of objective cost estimates from professionals. Several limitations exist. Firstly, the ability of the population at risk to pay the replacement cost places a downward bias on the results. Secondly, the method assumes that there are no secondary benefits associated with the replacement cost method. Thus, the values will be exaggerated as the full amount cannot be attributed to the environmental good or service. Thirdly, it assumes that full restitution can be made after damage, thus the loss is fully compensated. However, the original state of the environment cannot be restored completely and unknown long-term effects may occur. Thus, the method may underestimate the true value. Lastly, individuals who may have moved in anticipation of the environmental damage are excluded. The replacement cost will thus be insufficient for these parties as the threshold is higher than the remaining individuals. 
The preventative or mitigation expenditures approach focuses on the perceptions of potential damage, as well as the actual expenditure individuals incur to protect themselves and their property from this type of damage. Here, preventative expenditure refers to the avoidance of environmental damage, for example, to prevent soil erosion of a disturbed landscape. Measures could be put in place to stabilize the soil. While mitigation expenditure refers to expenditure that occurs after environmental damage has occurred to improve the situation. For example, if a noisy road or train system was developed next to a previously quiet residential area, the noise level could be improved by placing barricades such as walls or trees that would minimize the noisy levels flowing into the residential area. The techniques used would relate to either directly observing the expenditures made by individuals or asking them what they would be willing to pay to avoid the damage. Certain assumptions made play a limiting role on the accuracy of this method. The first relates to the assumption that the full cost of the environmental damage is reflected in the expenditure. This may not always be correct due to misperceptions of the damage risk and may thus differ resulting in an excessive or insufficient expenditure. Furthermore, the preventative or mitigatory measures can only prevent or correct damage up to a certain level. Secondly, it assumes that there are no additional benefits, as in the case of the replacement cost method, this would be an overestimate of the environmental value. The productivity loss or change method considers the environmental attribute as an input into production function. For example, the effect of soil erosion on agricultural productivity. Here, a change in the market price of the good or profits derived from the good due to changes in the environmental attribute is equivalent to the value of the environmental attribute. This holds when the attribute is the only cost of production borne by the producer and producers are price takers and thus do not cause price changes. The technique involves the determination of the physical effects or the establishment of the production function and then the establishment of the monetary values of the environmental attribute. Some limitations are the existence of multiple causes of an effect, the complexity of price changes and the lack of efficient markets in developing countries. The problem with multiple causes is that it becomes difficult to pinpoint the precise relationship between a specific cause and the effect. Price changes imply that a more in-depth study needs to occur in terms of the market structure, elasticities and supply and demand functions, as well as consumer behavior, as the future trends need to be established of this market. Inefficient markets imply that prices may either be non-existent or distorted, and thus the true economic value of an attribute could, cannot be easily established. The opportunity cost method looks at the value of lost opportunities due to environmental protection. In other words, if land were to be conserved, then the same land is no longer available for agriculture or other economic activities. The method would thus measure the foregone opportunities of those that are now explicitly not allowed any longer. There may also be a need to consider alternative forms of compensation, especially where rural or vulnerable communities are negatively impacted. The cost of illness approach measures changes in environmental quality on human livelihood as it relates to health. This approach includes treatment costs and loss of earnings. The conditions under which this method can be applied are when the illness is of a short duration and is discrete, thus there are no long-term effects and the disease is not life-threatening. When there is a direct cause and effect relationship, thus there is a proven linkage between the pollutant and the disease. And when accurate treatment costs and earnings data are available. This technique entails the estimation of a dose-response relationship, which is done through epidemiological or ecotoxicological studies. Then, the expected level of the pollutant needs to be estimated. The change in the level of the pollutant is fed into the dose response relationship. The exposed population must be identified and the expected health outcomes estimated given the changes in the pollutant. Finally, the economic value is estimated given the expected health outcomes. 
Problems with this method occur when individuals do not earn a wage, such as individuals involved in subsistence activities or unemployed individuals. And because different pollutants in the same medium cause different health effects, this is especially evident in air pollution. Here, the effects of each pollutant needs to be measured and synergistic effects need to be taken into account. The human capital approach is an extension of the cost of illness approach. It extends the mortality and chronic effects of changes in environmental quality. The method measures these health effects by discounting the present values of the individual's earnings over the remainder of their lives. Here, their income is the return on their human capital. The value of life is obtained by statistically estimating the probability of death due to the environmental quality change, and thus the monetary value is known as the value of a statistical life. This technique is used as follows. Firstly, the pollution load from all sources needs to be determined. Secondly, the ambient concentration needs to be determined by using dispersion models. Thirdly, you need to define the population at risk using its demographic composition, which includes characteristics such as age, income and gender. Next, a dose response function needs to be established. And then the link between morbidity and mortality and the decline in output needs to be determined, as well as the result, resulting treatment cost. Finally, you need to calculate the value of output loss and add the relevant treatment cost to this. An alternative to collecting primary or secondary data is to use the benefits transfer method. This approach transfers existing estimates from other similar studies to the project site. The existing study needs to be closely similar in terms of location on the current site and its environmental impact. The advantages of this method are that it provides a rapid estimation of the environmental values when compared to a new evaluation study. It is relatively cheap and allows one to estimate benefits of a new or previously unused environmental resource for the country. There are three types of transfer methods. The direct transfer method is the simplest transference method. This method assumes that the change in environmental quality experience in both sites is exactly the same. The technique applied here is to identify environmental impacts in the current study, to find previous studies that estimate these impacts and derive a mean unit value using these studies. Finally, to apply the mean unit value to the current study. The second method is the adjusted benefits transfer. This method uses the mean unit value mentioned previously and adjusted for differences in socioeconomic characteristics of households, differences in policy, projects or regulation, and differences in the availability of substitute goods and services. This is done to prevent the transference of inaccuracies or biases from the initial study site. The third and most sophisticated method of transference is the demand transfer. This uses the entire demand function from the initial study to the current study. This method uses the following steps. Firstly, a study that has estimated an appropriate existing demand function must be found. Secondly, the geographic area over which households will benefit from the change in environmental quality must be determined. Thirdly, the values of the independent variable for the individuals at the site is, is substituted into the willingness to pay equation at the initial site, and the benefits to individuals are estimated at the project site. Finally, the individual estimates must be aggregated to determine the total benefits for the study. There are four techniques associated with the indirect proxy or revealed preference approach. These use proxy markers that are not directly linked to the environmental good or service, but reveal the economic value of this good or service. The travel cost and hedonic pricing methods will be discussed in further detail below. Two other techniques are mentioned here. The first method is the res residual value method, which is a complex version of the hedonic pricing method. Here, the value of an environmental good or service is dependent on the full production chain. For instance, the value of timber is dependent on the final markets of pulp, paper and furniture. 
The second method is the implicit value method. It works backwards from a desired internal rate of return or net present value to determine what the appropriate level of the, of the value of the environmental good would need to be to justify an investment. The travel cost method estimates the recreational value of outer sites and resources. Since recreation is a non-consumptive direct use, no other values can be determined with this technique. This method uses a survey technique to estimate travel and on-site costs in order to generate a function of the number of visits given the incurred costs. This demand function is then used to estimate the consumer surplus of the site. The recreational value is in the consumer surplus as well as the actual expenditure. The travel cost method can take on two forms, namely the zonal form, where distances from the site are divided into zones as the distance increases and, in, and individuals are placed in their respective zones, or an individual form, where each individual is considered and lot, not lumped together. The steps are as follows. Firstly, the site area needs to be identified and boundaries placed around it. Once the site is identified, the particular environmental goods or services need to be defined. As several attributes can be provided by a particular site, the environmental goods or services being valued should be defined up front. Next, the survey questionnaire needs to be designed bearing in mind the environmental goods or services that are being valued and be able to elicit the necessary data. The questionnaire then needs to be implemented. Once the survey has been conducted, a demand curve must be determined. This entails removing invalid questionnaires and choosing a functional form for the demand curve. The consumer surplus is then estimated and finally, the actual expenditure is added to this to provide the total recreational value. Two major problems are related to the travel cost method. The first relates to opportunity cost of time. There is currently still a debate on the appropriate inclusion of time as a cost variable and it is generally advised that income is used as a proxy for the opportunity cost of leisure. The second problem is that substantial data is required. This includes data on number of visitors, the place of origin, the socioeconomic characteristics, the duration of trips and time spent on site, as well as a range of environmental quality attributes, etc. The hedonic pricing method rests on the assumption that goods and services are made up of a number of individual characteristics. Therefore, the value of goods and services are equal to the sum of these individual values. If a good contained an environmental attribute, then the value of the environmental attribute would be implicitly embedded in the market value of the good. Hedonic pricing is thus based on the premise that observed prices reveal the value of the good's characteristics. There are two focuses of hedonic pricing. The most important one is the property or land value approach. The second first focus is wage differentials. The assumptions for applying hedonic pricing to property is that there must be a well-functioning market with no market of policy failures. The technique followed is to firstly collect house price data and the associated characteristics of the houses. Secondly, to collect socioeconomic and demographic data of the residents in the area. Next, the house price function must be estimated using the various characteristics. Fourthly, the implicit marginal value of the environmental attribute must be determined using the first order derivatives. The demand function for the environmental attribute must then be estimated and the consumer surplus calculated. The application to wage differentials rests on the following assumptions. Firstly, that there is a good correlation between the wage level and various environmental risk characteristics. Secondly, that individuals have a choice of different income and wealth levels and are free to move between industries. Thirdly, they must be efficient and optimal functioning labor markets. Fourthly, it must be possible to isolate risk and determine its impact on income. Lastly, there must be good information available based on the data collection process. The technique consists of estimating an income function with various job-related characteristics, socioeconomic characteristics and mortality and morbidity risk as explanatory variables. The relevant data must be collected from the industries and locations, 
This is used to calculate the risk coefficient with statistical techniques. The value of a change in motility or morbidity risk is then calculated. The no proxy techniques are also known as the stated preferences techniques. Two techniques are discussed here. These are the contingent valuation and the conjoint analysis, which are based on the introduction of a hypothetical market. These are the only methods that are able to elicit non-use values of the environment. The contingent valuation method asks individuals to state their willingness to pay or willingness to accept for changes in the environmental quality or quantity given a hypothetical scenario. The technique followed is that the site, as well as the environmental goods and services and or environmental damage to be valued must be identified. The survey must be designed and tested. It is then implemented. The data collected is analyzed to estimate the individual's willingness to pay or willingness to accept and the willingness to pay or willingness to accept is aggregated. Several biases or errors can occur during the survey implementation phase due to individuals providing inaccurate information or there being some miscommunication between the numerator and the respondent. The first bias is the strategic bias that relates to the difference between an individual understating his or her willingness to pay in the hope of a free ride or overstating it to ensure the provision of a public good. The second bias relates to individuals who may feel it inappropriate to answer certain questions in a certain manner or may try to provide answers in order to please a numerator. This is known as the compliance bias. The third bias occurs when a bidding game is played that avoids distortion from outliers but may incur a starting point bias. Finally, the information bias may occur due to a badly designed survey where questions are misinterpreted by respondents. The conjoint analysis determines an individual's preferences across various characteristics of a multi-attribute choice. The technique involves the presentation of two alternatives that have a stated level and range of specific characteristics that include price. The individual ranks each characteristic and then makes a final choice between the two alternatives based on the individual's rankings. A relationship is then derived between the characteristic and the specific preferences using statistical techniques. One can then derive a preference function that indicates a willingness to pay for changes in other characteristics. The advantage of this method of the contingent valuation method is that individuals are not faced with the direct trade-off between money and environmental quality in a hypothetical market and therefore do not make poor value judgments during the interview. Respondents tend to be more familiar with these types of questions and can thus more easily answer them, and the method is less subjective. It is even important to note that this method is still subject to external factors and should thus be stated in terms of a range of values rather than a single answer.